Good morning. This is Dr. David Nace, uh, Chief Medical Officer for Innovacer. Welcome to the webinar, Beyond Interoperability, Data Activation and Artificial. We're going to talk today about a very interesting topic, Beyond Interoperability. We've all been talking about interoperability for some time to talk about data activation and how artificial intelligence is starting to make a play and will play a very big role in healthcare going forward. So with that, and no further ado, let me just go over some housekeeping rules before we introduce our guests. So um, as we move forward, we'll be taking questions at the end. You should see a chat box on your right. Please enter questions throughout the webinar that you may have. We'll be tracking them and watching them. And we'll use this for our questions at various times through the webinar as well as at the end of the session. So with that, let me introduce our guest speakers. So welcome, gentlemen. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Peter Lee, Corporate Vice President for Healthcare at Microsoft. Peter, welcome. Uh, thank you, David. It's uh, great to be here. Awesome. And we have Dr. Stephen Klaskow, President and CEO of the Thomas Jefferson University and Health System. Uh, Steve, welcome. So, you know- I'm glad thing... to be here with you and Peter, sorry. <laughs> so one thing I really would love to say is just that, you know, Dr. Glasgow, I understand you've been recently selected as one of the top 50 most influential clinical executives again by Modern Healthcare. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Great to have you both here. So let's start off. You know, there's a lot of discussion around data. We've been talking about it for a long time and that data is going to be the lifeblood of everything we do. So let's start off with you, Dr. Lee. Um, tell us a little bit about why data might be important in healthcare. Well, one thing that's happened is uh, that there's been a new generation of machine learning technologies uh, that have become incredibly effective at converting data uh, into models, at, at really analyzing the uh, kind of underlying and hidden representations and structure in data and in, encapsulating them in models that allow you to do pretty amazing things with uh, recognizing objects and images and understanding speech and language uh, and discerning uh, kind of patterns uh, that are predictive of future events. Um, and the scale that those new algorithms such as uh, deep learning uh, are able to operate at uh, have, have really had a transformational effect on lots and lots of industries. Um, and given that healthcare is increasingly becoming a data-driven uh, kind of endeavor, uh, our attention naturally turns to the question of whether these AI technologies and these new machine learning algorithms uh, can be used to improve healthcare. So lots of insights that we can get about what's happening, what will happen, how we can predict things to get in the future. Steve, you run a large health system, and I think you're already leveraging data to some extent. How has data been influencing the way Jefferson delivers healthcare, and then where do you see the future for data? Well, look, I think you know one of the things that sometimes is a misnomer, people say we don't have enough data. We are up to our patootin data. It's just that literally what we do with that. And I think one of the things that I really applaud what Microsoft is doing is that they're trying to be the conduit uh, for us, you know, through the cloud and through other data to make sure that we can create actionable ways of looking at things through that data. So just to give you an example, it's very similar to the issue with genomics. We're now working with a company to take our 32,000 employees offer them all free genomic and subtyping because we can now risk stratify them and change some of the things we're doing based on bringing that data together. So for the first time, we can start to use data in a way that makes a difference now, not just for a revenue cycle, not just for EMRs, but to really look in a population health manner of what portion of the population has the best chance of doing better uh, because of an interaction. I really like that issue that we have too much data. And I've heard often people talk about a data swamp, like they can't use the data. So I really like what you said about making that data actionable, because that's what's key. You know, we talk a lot about these terms, and I heard several of them already, deep learning, artificial intelligence. 
a lot of people get confused. Peter, can you help bring some, some common sense so that people can sort of think about these terms, how they relate? Sure, happy to do that. And, um, you know, it is a question that really uh, comes up over and over again. And so the image that you see here on the screen uh, is really meant to kind of give the big picture. You know, so the, the big circle, you know, it represents this thing that we don't fully understand, which is this notion of intelligence. And for a long time, for several decades, there's been a field of research called artificial intelligence. And we don't really know if uh, artificial intelligence, you know, can be, you know, capture all of what we think of as intelligence uh, or not. But, you know, generally, uh, I think it's it's safe to assume that it's uh, some some subset of the notion of intelligence. When we are talking about AI today in the practical world of healthcare, we're generally speaking talking about machine learning, some application of machine learning. And machine learning is this idea of a machine that gets better with experience, the, that the more it's used, the more effective and the smarter uh, it, uh, it operates. And that's a whole field of research study in, in itself uh, in the field of computer science. But then when we actually get to the real world today, from this big idea of machines that get better with experience, what we're actually deploying in practical systems today is a very narrow subset of the idea of machine learning, which is machine learning where the machines get better with data. The more data that they see, the better that they operate, the more intelligently they can make decisions, the more intelligently they can classify objects and so on. And then within that, there's even a smaller subset that is really the practical core today, uh, which is machine learning from data, but the, where the training, the experience is supervised uh, through human labeling. And so in, in essence, all of the AI that we're seeing today is AI that is learning from the intelligence of human beings, from understanding and watching uh, the what's called the digital exhaust of human thought and experience. And what's remarkable is, despite the fact that that's such a tiny little kind of kind of dot in this whole idea about AI, uh, there is just already just tremendous potential uh, to improve the human condition uh, and to do it in a way that really powers the uh, economies around the world. Well, that's really insightful. Steve, what are your views here? How does this relate to what you do day to day? Well, look, I think that um, there's, there's, there's no question that uh, machine learning and, 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 and the kind of cognition that, that we're talking about is going to fundamentally transform how we're able to deliver care in a positive way. I think, though, what I spend a lot of time concentrating on is um, what does that mean to the human in the middle? And when you really think about it, David, you know, we've spent almost, you know, the last 40 years selecting and educating docs to be really good machines. What can you memorize, you know, do the MedCats so that if I know 19 reasons somebody has jaundice and you only know 15, I'm a better, I'm a better doctor than you. I think what we haven't done a good enough job of is recognizing that once once we have uh, a Microsoft uh, product or, or, or an IBM Watson next to us, it's going to be much better than us at doing that, that we need to select and educate docs around empathy, self-awareness, and, and communication skills. In, in essence, we have to create humans to be better humans rather than to be machines. So I'm, I'm very excited about what deep learning and, and, and machine cognition will bring, bring to, to our experience, but I think we need to look at humans differently. There are two great quotes that I use all the time. One is from Roland Molnar, who said, technology will replace 80% of what doctors do, which always gets my colleagues very upset. And the other one was from Vinod Kosla, who said, any doctor that can be replaced by a computer probably should be. That's hilarious. So I, I, I've heard you say this before, let robots be robots and let humans be humans. I think it's a great quote. Um, let's talk about how AI actually is experienced by all of us every day. You know, what are some of the impacts that AI has already had, Peter? Yeah, you know, it's um, the way that we look at this from a technology perspective uh, are the different foundational algorithms. And one of the amazing things about AI technologies is that uh, they have such a general purpose. You know, they, they can be applied in so many different ways. 
so you know if we're talking about you know uh, travel and travel planning and and all of the kind of optimization of logistics um, those things are fundamental today uh, in the travel industry um, but those same algorithms then also apply to the ways that uh, Federal Express and UPS uh, determine their <clears throat> shipping routes. Um, those same foundational algorithms then can be used in a completely different way uh, to, to do uh, recommendation engines, uh, to present you uh, with the movies that you're most likely to be interested in and to rank them uh, in ways that have kind of remarkable eeriness. I think we've all probably experienced in our social media channels uh, you know, the, the eerie experience of having talked about some product uh, with a friend on one day and then the next day seeing that product show up in an advertisement. The, the AI that powers uh, that capability to get those insights um, is again using the same set of fundamental algorithms. And then yeah. this even goes into self-driving cars with the computer vision and the route determination. It just goes on and on. And so the, the fundamental nature of these things is sort of uh, is just truly remarkable, and it all gets fueled today by by data. So we're all experiencing this every day. You know, why haven't we seen this come to healthcare? What's been the barrier? What's going on here, Steve? So, yeah. So so first of all, let, let me just um, I think the the two areas um, that that I'm really uh, most excited about is um. One is, I think for the first time, we're starting to get into uh, consumer segmentation. I mean, one of the things that always makes me laugh, we talk about being patient-centered, like there's one patient out there. Um, you know, whereas, you know, uh, you know Amazon, um, you know, has 1,987,000 different uh, types of consumers and interacts with them differently. In healthcare, I think we can start to use AI and we're starting to do it around looking at the fact that a 62-year-old with a Fitbit and an Aura ring uh, we're going to interact with differently and have different needs than a 25-year-old disengaged person or a 70-year-old woman with cancer uh, that, that, that doesn't use those things. So I think AI can really help us start to, to, to um, segment, uh, segment consumers. And I think the, the, the second thing I think that's um, incredibly exciting for us in AI is where you start to, you, you mentioned self-driving cars. My talk at the World Economic Forum was moving from self-driving cars to self-healing humans. And I think as we start to think about wearables, AI, and virtual voice assistants, you start to look at a, a world not too many years from now where you can actually start to have um, people with chronic conditions go to sleep at night, have their pajamas record the things they need to record. If you have asthma, recording your respiratory rate, have your virtual voice assistant look at what the pollen count and the AQI is. And then when you wake in the, up in the morning, you know, beyond just listening to the daily podcast and what's the weather, you'll be able to decide how many uh, uh, um, shots of your of your inhaler you should take. So I think I think um, part of the reason this hasn't happened is because in healthcare we we are pretty risk averse, and frankly most of the leaders, especially of large academic systems, grown up in an academic mindset where these things are the other. And you know I think one of the things that we differentiate us in Jefferson as Peter knows I spend you know at least once a month out at Silicon Valley and we're starting to implant literally some of our no that's a great 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 background uh Peter your thoughts about why there's been barriers to adoption of AI in healthcare yeah it's um you know there's a I, I got quoted in an embarrassing way in the press a, a few months ago saying that uh, a a tech person uh, deciding to focus on healthcare is the best career ending move you can make. <laughs> and, you know, and the, and I think that there's been, there have been so many uh, kinds of attempts to inject uh, AI technologies and AI experiences into healthcare. Um, and they consistently run into a wide range of incredible complications. Uh, some of them uh, have to do with patient safety um, and kind of regulatory issues you know it uh, if we look uh, this was uh, something that came out in eric topol's uh, book uh, deep medicine just recently uh, if you actually look at the number of randomized trials of ai powered uh, therapeutics or diagnostics that have been in the published uh, literature for uh, medical research the total number in history today has been one um, and that's because today's AI systems are really, for the large, uh, for the most part, trained on retrospective data. 
And, and so there is just a fundamental question that when we're in the diagnostic or therapeutic space about the safety and efficacy of these systems. And this is something that the FDA is grappling with right now to kind of uh, make this an easier process and a clear process that still maintains patient safety. But, but that's one set of problems. Another set of problems is that there's incredible complexity because people forget it's only been in the past 15 years that there has been this wholesale digitization of healthcare data. It, it's happened, it feels slow, because it's a little bit like watching grass grow, but it's happened with incredible rapidity for a gigantic healthcare system. Um, and so there's incredible complexity just in the integration of technologies and the d sheer diversity of uh, deployment scenarios. And, and so I think it's just put us in a, a situation now where uh, any innovators really have to find ways to grapple with that kind of um, uh, with that kind of diversity. And David, David, I think the other, the other thing that that has limited us somewhat is, you know, that we're still in the mindset of, you know, I, I make my money by people coming into my hospital, and you know, most of AI and and a lot of what Peter and we are working on is how can uh, how can we keep you from having to utilize our traditional uh, services? And you know, it's that quote that that we always like to use. Uh, uh, it's hard to get somebody to do something when their salary depends upon them not doing it. Yeah, that's a great point, Steve. So and you know, you and I have really worked uh, together in many instances to try to encourage people to see the bigger picture. That uh, kind of the more that people uh, come together uh, and come together with data, the the you know that tide will you know lift all boats. And and so uh, I think we'll get there. But but right now the competitive pressures, I think, uh, as you say, do work against us. Now, this is great um, background, and, you know, I think, Peter, to your point, we have, you know, through the stimulus plan, we've put digitalization in healthcare to collect the data with the HRs and the like, but we haven't really made that data actionable, and people are struggling with that. But the AI is really going to help us with that. Let's take a moment and see what our audience is experiencing around AI. Let's take a quick poll. So, for those of you in the audience, if you could just take a look at the questions and then uh, respond to the poll you're going to get that your organization's already using AI, you're ready and you have a plan, you want to use AI, but you're not quite sure where to start, and we're not quite ready for AI, we're not really sure what's going on. So if we could uh, take that poll and we'll get the results in just a minute. In the meantime, you know, one of the things, uh, Peter, that we've experienced is other industries have transformed. Some people point to the the airline industry is one that really went through 20 years ago, a dramatic uh, shift with the use of data and, and connectivity and AI. Um, can you provide from your experience of other industries, maybe using the airline or others, about where that transformation's happened, how quickly it's happened, what we might be looking at in the future for healthcare? Sure. You know, it, it, interoperability, of course, comes up uh, in all of these situations um, and interoperability uh, comes up because it's been so transformational. That was true uh, in the airline industry. Uh, we see that in the financial services industry today. You know, much of the foundation of your financial security and, and the safety of, of the, the entire industry is coming from the kind of data cooperation uh, that's happening there. Um, we're seeing that today in the automotive industry around telematics um, because the entire industry recognizes that their futures depend on all of their vehicles being able to talk to each other in real time. Uh, we're seeing that in the telecom industry. Uh, increasingly manufacturing, uh, supply chain optimization, just all of these tremendous things that can benefit the entire industry by a wide spread application and handoff of data intelligence from one organization to the other, uh, all sort of motivate these things. And, and this, we believe, needs to happen and will happen uh, within the health industry. Uh, of course, the question is uh, exactly when. Yep. Do we have the poll results? Let's take a look at the poll results are in. We can pull them up. Give that just a second. Steve, I know you're going through the transformation right now. Where would you rank Jefferson? And ah, here are the results. And then we can kind of relate this to Jefferson's experience. 
uh, my look at this. Uh, most people want to use AI, but they really don't know what to do. What do you guys think of this? Look, I, I think I, I, it's not at all surprising. I mean, because part of it, you, you have to understand if you're if this isn't your world, um, and you know, you you go to Hims, you know, or one of the national uh, um, IT AI things. Literally, there's 850 young men and women at exhibits that say, you have to see my new AI you know, application and buy it because it's going to transform healthcare. And it's usually like a revenue cycle app. So you know, the, the fact is, it's confusing. And, and I think that uh, if it's, again, I'm going to get back to most of us as healthcare leaders, it's not where our expertise is. We're, uh, we're, we'd probably be where the, um, we'd be somewhere between the 23% and, and the 13%. Uh, we're going through some AI related implementations um, and, uh, and we're now starting to create a, a plan working with some larger groups. But our whole idea, which I think really fits with Microsoft and Peter's goal, is that it's not, well, we're gonna do one thing here and one thing here, that AI becomes part of our entire population health uh, strategy. But yeah, it's going to be very similar to what we went through when ACO started. Everybody said they wanted to start an ACO because um, they felt they needed to start an ACO, but they didn't really know what it meant. And that's yeah, a one great... thing. Go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I think one thing that uh, I, I see just in terms of the maturity of the technology, um, it, it, the core technology is just maturing very, very rapidly and is incredibly capable. But it's today packaged up as uh, essentially as a toolbox. In fact, um, you know, I, I work closely with the commercial business here in Judson Althoff, and Judson is is uh, famous internally within Microsoft of complaining that we're showing up to places like uh, uh, like Thomas Jefferson uh, Health with a big bag of tools, a Craftsman tool kit, um, and saying, "Hey, here's all the tools you need to build your great uh, AI-powered health system," um, and that's a true statement, uh, but it takes today still a significant amount of work and some insight and commitment uh, to, to make use of those tools. And so I think one of the things that will help get over this barrier, um, and this is sort of implied by what uh, Steve uh, uh, said and what he's been working on, uh, is converting more and more of those things into ready-made solutions. So ready-made solutions for population health uh, analytics, so ready-made solutions for patient engagement, ready-made solutions for uh, for uh, uh, reduction of clinical variance and so on. And, and I think that uh, the conversion or the maturation of these things from uh, from sets of tools into solutions, I think will, will really be a, make a profound difference. So I love this cartoon that uh, you can't list your iPhone as your primary care physician. And that really brings us to the point that's Steve has brought up is that technology in and of itself with the toolkit won't be the answer and that we need doctors too. How do we sort that out, Steve? Oh, look, I think um, it, it's actually not that difficult. Um, we, we started a program where we started to choose students based on self-awareness, empathy, and, uh, and communication skills. I mean, you and I have talked, David, you know, we still accept students based on science, GPA, med cats, and organic chemistry grades, and we're amazed that doctors aren't more empathetic, communicative, and creative. And at the point that there's a 100% chance there's going to be something next to me that's going to be better at memorizing things than I am, it gives us a real opportunity to both change our curriculum and change, uh, and, and change how we select docs. It increases diversity and that we can literally for the first time start to get doctors or create doctors that are more human. Um, at the World Economic Forum, uh, Jack Ma uh, had a great quote. He said, you know, when we created cars, we didn't try to get um, uh, humans to, 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 to run faster, and we created planes, we didn't try to get humans to fly. Computers, AI will always be smarter than doctors, but they'll never be as wise. And you know, we're gonna have to really start to rethink what the role of the human is, I think, in a, in a very positive way. Peter, how do you think about that from the Microsoft side, where you're focused on the technology? How do you build technology to really bring the human focus back? You know, the, the more that we've interacted with people who are on the very front lines of delivering healthcare, doctors, nurses, administrators, others, I, um, the, the more impressed we are. I mean, people work incredibly hard and they have incredible stresses and, and burdens. And, and so, you know, we take it really almost personally uh, that the 
technologies don't seem to be helping in the right ways. And so uh, we've really been trying to understand exactly you know, how can we insert intelligent technologies uh, into the workflow of what people do in order to uh, enable them, in order to liberate them, to focus on you know, what they've really signed up to do, which is to take care of people. Um, so, so for example, uh, you know, the burden of clinical documentation uh, is, uh, is just this huge, hairy problem. Um, and if nothing else, Microsoft is a company that is dedicated to helping people create documentation. And so we think very hard about, well, are there AI technologies for natural language processing, for speech processing and so on, that might give us a chance uh, to, to ease that burden? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, Steve, you've done a wonderful job at an academic medical center at Thomas Jefferson with really segregating this out and thinking about how do you train humans to be humans. And I think, um, I think you know, we also have the Microsoft view of, Peter, how technology has been trying to focus on that. So there's a lot here we can learn. Like, is there much that we can automate that people are currently doing? You, you bring up the fact that just typing in the computer has taken a lot away from medicine trying to capture the data. What are ways that we can automate? What are ways that AI can really help us? And how can we influence the training to allow humans to really focus on that human capability? Yeah, well, I, th I think there are a lot of ways. And I think that, the, you know, first of all, um, uh, I think whether it's telehealth or automation or AI, it can start to bring uh, specialists closer to outlying areas. We now do 35% of our, we have 36 hospitals that use us for our stroke unit we do about 35% of our post-op exams um, literally at home. You know, we send people home with a robot, we get the data and we're able to do, do, do it at home. I think that the key is, I think honestly, the problem sometimes, David and Peter in healthcare is that we like to mail it in. We say, we need to do telehealth. So I'm gonna go and just get a company so that some doctor in Ohio at midnight can talk to my patients. At Jefferson, you know, we, we decided that we were gonna, not concentrate on the technology, but concentrate on how we can get care closer to home. And one of the people that's really helped me with that is our commencement speaker uh, this year, uh, Peter Peter Scully, because you know he said, look, you know, he said you guys have to stop talking about things like telehealth and AI as an end to itself. So we don't talk about telebanking. We don't get up in the morning and say, I think I'm going to telebank. It's just that 95% of banking went from being in the bank to being at home. He said, if that's your goal. Then, that, then you need to start talking about it that way. So as you know, David, we started talking about Jefferson as healthcare with no address. That we want Jefferson to be defined by the care and caring we give starting at home. Then that sets the table to work with, Peter, with people like Peter. It sets the table, for example, to work with a company we're working for around transportation that's using AI to figure out exactly what transportation that patient will need to get her to which site they need. Um, and, and, and it's also created a, a mindset where people in Silicon Valley or, or, or Boston or, or Microsoft can say, wow, you know, we have, a, we have a, 20, a top 25 academic medical center that's willing to think 180 degrees. And we've had a lot of folks come to us, again, as Peter said, not here's one app, but here's can we, where we can work with you to achieve our goal. One of the really exciting things I know Peter and, and Innovacer are both working on is the whole issue with the fire technologies are really creating a layer on top of the traditional EMRs so that literally uh, uh, your EMR can be your, 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 your basis, but you're able to create, for lack of a better word, an app store that gets you to where you need to get to without saying, oh, if I'm Cerner, I have to use this. If I'm Epic, I have to use this. If I'm Allscripts, I have to use this. Peter, thoughts? It's, um, you know, first of all, you know, I think that uh, one reason why I'm so optimistic about this, uh, even though there are huge challenges, is that uh, there is just this foundation of digital data, and you know the the huge benefit that the electronic health record systems, um, despite all of the issues that people have with them right now, there is this gigantic foundational benefit in having achieved that that digital that digital base. And now, on top of that, as um, uh, Steve was mentioning, you know, what is the next layer that really now kind of unleashes innovation and supports uh, a whole new generation of intelligent applications and solutions? Um, and so that, you know, that is now we can actually 
meaningfully design and architect and, and start to build that. And, and that's been a big uh, part of our strategy. On the people aspect of this, you know, increasingly uh, healthcare is a very personal thing that I think will go into the home and have a consumer focus. But on the health system side, uh, I think it's also the case that it will be an even more collaborative endeavor than it is today. And so just the coordination of all of the people in the team, you know, that have to collaborate effectively in order to provide care to you, uh, those all end up creating more opportunities for AI. The way that we can smartly connect people, uh, the ways that we can smartly provide information to people when and where they need it so they can the most effectively react. Uh, all of those things end up being uh, AI and interaction problems um, that, that support the collaborative effort of healthcare. No, those are great points. And, you know, I think about the fact, Peter, that, you know, at Microsoft, you've been an investor and an innovator, and, and Steve, you've been a great advisor to us. You know, this is exactly the way we've thought about it, is that you need to, it's not just interoperability. People talk about that like it's a holy grail, but they don't really understand the importance of these key aspects. How do you create automation and get data to really support the different people to collaborate? How do you trigger these processes based on the data? And how do you, I think to your point, Peter, how do you engage providers and patients at the point of care or their, their point of their life flow and allow clinical decision-making across all of those entities that be done in a, in a collaborative process? But it really requires a scalable, private and secure data activation platform. You have to activate the data, not just have it be interoperable. Um, Peter, can you say a little bit about from that perspective of why you got interested in Innovation and the work we're doing here and how it aligns with your work at Microsoft? Sure. You know, it really for us starts from asking ourselves the question, you know, do we have a right to exist in healthcare at all? You know, what does Microsoft have to offer? In fact, the way we ask the question is, if Microsoft were to disappear today, would healthcare be harmed or held back in any bad ways tomorrow or into the future? And once you start a asking that question, you start realizing you, it takes you very quickly to the, to the question about data activation uh, that, that you've mentioned. Uh, and we start to understand that we do have a role in providing an infrastructure, a digital infrastructure foundation uh, for companies like Innovacer uh, to, uh, to provide value, uh, value to have kind of smarter, uh, and kind of more holistic uh, aggregation and presentation of data uh, to people when and where they need it. So we've been working very hard to work with companies like Innovacer to understand what their needs are, to ensure that our cloud and services really support the kinds of things that you're trying to accomplish, um, and then do everything we can to, uh, to, to kind of create scale and success there. So in a way we're hoping uh, that we can be an enabler uh, for kind of the future information technology infrastructure uh, that, that powers healthcare. No, I appreciate that. And Steve, you've talked a lot about the importance in a healthcare environment to not only be transparent, but to do, the, do so in a private and fair way that's accountable as a healthcare system. How do you see like how a healthcare data activation platform might be uh, a solution in a scalable way for healthcare? Look, I think that um, anything that um, uses data and the cloud and AI to uh, connect me closer to to uh, patients, to allow me to have uh, to allow the patients to have better access, to improve my quality and decrease my cost is really is really what my holy grail is. Um, so I think that you know, uh, as I start to look at what Innovator and, and and others are doing, you know, around some of that transparency and accountability and getting the doctor and the patient closer so that I can do the things that I have to do as a human, that becomes, uh, that, that becomes incredibly important. So on the human side, you know, one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is this issue of the social determinants of healthcare, right? So traditionally, healthcare has been delivering clinical services that are on a fee schedule. And now we realize that, geez, most of the impact is zip code, zip code, credit score, all these issues that really influence not only a population, but that influence the outcome of care in the presence of chronic disease. Um, 
Steve, like how, how can we, how can AI help to address this issue? This is a whole new world to explore. Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, and I think, uh, I think people are just starting to really look at that. Um, we had a call earlier today with the World Economic Forum, and it's going to be a major, major piece of, of, of the World Economic Forum because, because for the last five years, we've been, you know, just agreeing that social determinants of health are A, a big problem, and B, you know, sort of unsolvable. And the one thing about those, those health inequities and, and, and social determinants is it's really the one thing that's global. I mean, the, the difference in health outcomes in, in one zip code in Philadelphia and another is not dissimilar to the difference in health outcomes in urban Durban versus rural Durban. So the combination of telehealth and the ability to look at social factors and having uh, uh, augmented intelligence bring the patient and the, and the provider together can start to coordinate population health. So we've had we've had discussions with some of the AI vendors around literally starting to use machine cognition in social agencies and saying, you know, we have a place called Esperanza, which takes care of most of the uh, north northeast Philadelphia Latino population. So really going in and not at my hospital and looking at that data set but at the social agency and home data set and saying, Steve, here's the one action that you could do that would have the greatest impact in childhood obesity in this community. It might be different than, than what would exist in another community. The, the one other point I'd like to make, David, is that we start to have to, we're starting to have to understand where, I know there's a lot of questions about where do you need a human and where do you need, where do you need the robot? What's fascinating is in behavioral health, what we find is that people under 40, would much rather talk to a bot about their mental health problem that, by about 70% than a human. And if they're, if they're a person of color um, and that human's gonna look like me, but the bot or the avatar looks like them, that almost goes up to 90%. So the fact is that we, that, that we might say, boy, that's something that needs a human. But the fact is the person in the middle is saying, I feel more comfortable uh, with that bot. So I think we have to look at which things uh, and we have to go to the patients and have them be the determiner. Yeah, there's a, there's a great insights and great provocative questions. Let's go back to our audience and kind of ask how they're looking at using social determinants and how they're managing the social risk. So a couple questions here. People, do people feel they're effectively leveraging and managing these new forms of data to manage social risk beyond traditional clinical? Do they have some knowledge, but they don't manage them? Are they just getting started or they're really not sure what to do and they're not doing anything yet? So while we're taking that poll, I want to pick up on that point, Steve. So one of the audience has sent out a question that relates to work that's being done in the UK and China, where nurse call centers are using AI-driven bots to do most of the work of the call center that humans used to do, and that the humans are pulled in late when there's red flags on the algorithms. So I, I want to switch to Peter for a second. Like, how do, in healthcare, you know, healthcare is a really important issue for people. How do you think about when, you know, AI may be dangerous or when it may be safe? How do you build in those guardrails? You know, we've had lots of warnings that AI may be the biggest threat to mankind. How do you think about that when you're moving Microsoft into healthcare around AI? Yeah, it's uh, such a, an important question. And um, one thing that's happened at Microsoft because of this is there has been the uh, construction of an uh, internal governance process that's uh, that is codenamed Ether. Um, it's an AI ethics review, um, and so every time questions are raised, there is a set of working groups and a governance process that goes up a chain of command uh, to provide adjudication on issues that are raised um, uh, with respect to ethical uh, or legal uh, considerations in AI technologies. Um, and if that uh, adjudication process fails to really come to a firm decision, uh, then we try to seek uh, outside help, uh, sometimes going so far as to uh, uh, to ask governments, relevant governments, uh, to look into legislation or new regulations. So for example, uh, when questions within Microsoft were raised about the ethical considerations of, around facial recognition, uh, this went through the Ether process. And ultimately, uh, when we realized that this was a question, these were questions that were bigger than Microsoft, um, we uh, recommended to several governments, including the US government, um, 
uh, to look into uh, regulating the technology. So that whole ethical process, I think, is a human process. Uh, so it has all of the human failings, but it's a very careful and thorough one. And I think that we'll see that kind of pattern emerge in more and more technology companies as the AI gets uh, kind of more impactful in, in the day-to-day -day lives of people. Yeah, I think, I think David, we also have to we also have to recognize there are cultural differences. So, I mean, you mentioned China, and you just look at uh, how uh, China or, or folks in China have been willing to become cashless and willing to look at a you know virtual society and just about everything. It's quite different than what would be acceptable here. So, I think uh, uh, that's not a good or bad thing. It's just it's just uh, what cultures are, are are willing to do and, and get used to. Yeah, it's a great point. And, you know, we've really learned so much and we're doing a lot with um, chatbot technologies in China. Um, and um, we've brought m many of those technologies to the U.S. Uh, our health bot system is used by quite a few uh, healthcare organizations in the U.S. for medical triage, for lab test reminders and so on. But, you know, I think overall, the attachment and the comfort level is, is different in the U.S. than, than in China. Yeah, I think it's subsets. I think as Steve pointed out, you know, from a behavioral standpoint, people are much more comfortable using a bot. So, um, and it becomes really important when you start talking about the social right risk, the social issues where things can get very personal beyond just healthcare. Uh, with that said, let's take a look at what our audience is doing to leverage data outside of the traditional healthcare system. Do we have the poll results that we can bring up? No, we're still waiting for those. Poll has been launched. And here they are. Oh, interesting. Wow, what do you guys make of this? I, I think it's it, it's not surprising um, in that, um, we, look, we, it's all in the front of our minds, but it, it's the same same thing, you know, I just gave a talk for the uh, Association of Health Insurance Professionals, and, um, you know, we're still at the point, we spend so much time about talking, going from volume to value. And if you came down from Mars, you'd say, say, wow, boy, everybody must really be, you know, working on a value-based system. And when I talk to providers, and, you know, I might have 100 people in the audience, I say, how many of you have more than 10% of, um, of your revenue based on population, health, and value? And I'll maybe get five or six hands. The average is about 5 to 8%. So, so the, the issue, I think this is exactly what I expect. We, we know where the social risks are. Um, um, we we're generally not managing them for two reasons. One is we don't really know how to, and secondly is we don't really get paid to do that. Most CEOs do not have an incentive for the first year. I have 25% of my personal incentive is based on reducing health inequities in Philadelphia, but that's not that's probably one percent of the uh, of the hospital CEOs. Most of our incentives are you know what's your EBITDA, what's your hospital census, et cetera. So the social risk becomes something you're also doing as opposed to what you are doing. No, that I will sense. I will say on the with some of the payers that uh, have growing uh, managed care uh, uh, populations, uh, particularly things like Medicare Advantage or managed uh, Medicaid. You know, I think that those sort of value-based uh, pair uh, populations uh, are starting to put into action more machine learning and data analytics insights uh, that pertain to social risks, uh, really trying to understand the impact of social isolation or lack of transportation or uh, food security. Um, and, and so the care managers increasingly are gathering that data as they interact uh, with their covered lives. And those are feeding into some increasingly sophisticated machine learning and AI based systems. Um, and there, I think the business case is so clear that it sort of motivates uh, going there. Uh, but overall, I, I, I agree with Steve that um, you know, it's still very early days, particularly uh, in the uh, health provider or health delivery side. Yeah, and I think about all of these things we've been talking about where AI may revolutionize genomics, I think as Steve talked about at Jefferson and precision medicine that may come from that. Imaging, clearly AI has been playing a role where AI may play a, a more precise role of reading images than humans have historically. 
I mean, there's really a lot of hope here for the future. You know, one way that people are experiencing today is just communication, which is a social issue, right? Where people who don't speak English end up in a, in a setting where no one can communicate, but that's changed. I think, Peter, you've had some experience with this in the Spanish speaking population. Yes, um, you know, where we work, uh, of course, with a lot of retailers and particularly pharmacies. Uh, uh, some of our biggest clients are companies like Walgreens and Walmart that have very significant pharmacy operations. And one of the challenges, of course, is that somebody comes to the pharmacy uh, speaking, uh, uh, being a non-English speaker. Um, and the potential for mistakes it goes up dramatically um, in, in one study. Uh, the incidence of uh, prescription errors uh, and uh, ad adherence uh, are several factors worse uh, when there's a language gap. Uh, and so just the simple AI technology of an online speech-to-speech uh, -speech translator uh, to translate between Spanish, for example, and English uh, has a dramatic impact on, uh, on the reduction of um, error and motivates better medication adherence. And then on top of that, the computer vision technologies that just help people sort out and remind them you know, what, what pills are what um, is, adds another layer to that. And I, I think, you know, um, we're real excited because I think there's opportunities even to, to be more efficient in a hospital uh, setting. We, we started a pilot at Methodist. If you think about uh, a Vietnamese patient uh, who's in the hospital and the room is hot, um, literally, you know, she's saying something, somebody has to come up from someplace that can speak Vietnamese to find out the room's hot, we got to get a nurse to, so we're actually working with a uh, virtual voice assistant technology that can do three or four or five things within the room and will obviously translate whatever, whatever language that patient is. She says, you know, I'm hot in the room, it'll automatically turn down the temperature, it'll say back in Vietnamese, let me know if that's okay. Um, those kind of things might seem simple, but A, they're exciting, and B, as they expand their capabilities, I think it'll make a big difference. No, I think that's a really nice illustration of AI being coupled to really automate a lot of tasks that traditionally humans would do running up and down stairs, and that would be you know, sort of, why, let's let robots do what robots do, and let humans do what humans should do. That's great. So, you know, we all talk about, like, how do we bring technology into healthcare you know, the stimulus plan created EHRs, it may not have been a great value proposition at first, but we're trying to figure out how to do it now that we've collected the data. How do we think going forward and really enhancing the value chain, right, with AI? How do we make healthcare more efficient? Where, what are your thoughts about that? Let's talk about value creation. Well, look, I think, I think um, value, the, the world that I see is, is that, the, the, um, the different layers of healthcare uh, become sort of uh, defragmented. So, uh, you know, I personally don't think, for example, that there will be any large provider that doesn't have at least a strategically aligned uh, payer partner. So I think the, it gets back to the original thing we said about how do we take all the data and have it help us provide better care, better access, better patient experience at a lower cost. You know, I think that, that AI can start to sift through that and help me communicate with my strategic blue line payer, help me communicate uh, with my supply chain folks so that I'm doing just-in-time inventories, et cetera, and literally help me communicate directly with my patient so that I can give the patient the best idea of where she should go. I mean, I'll give you just an example that's going on now. With our 32,000 employees, we now have a situation where we've told them, if they go through Jeff Connect and come into my ED, uh, it'll be a zero deductible. If they if they go through uh, if they don't go through Jeff Connect, it'll be a five hundred dollar deductible. And we're working with Aetna and some AI work to literally to the point where we can now get forty five percent of our non trauma non ambulance patients not having to go to our ED either through urgent care or through telehealth or through an appointment next morning, with some AI technology with telehealth and with with starting to get their data and organizing it. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think Steve's really hitting on the core point about just connecting better uh, with with patients and connecting better uh, amongst the kind of uh, collaborators in the care team. And those those connections, I think, are, are really going to be things that it will have a profound impact. Uh, I think even sooner than that, um, we're going to see, I think, 
a tidal wave of AI or and machine learning powered diagnostics and therapeutics uh, starting to uh, enter the market. I think we're already starting to see early signs of, of uh, an acceleration there. Um, FDA is is really thinking hard about the uh, you know about how to improve the approval processes and how to think about the patient safety aspects of that. But um, but these things are are coming on pretty fast, and I think uh, they have a, an easier time injecting into the workflow since they they sort of uh, are already part of the thought process in the delivery of healthcare around diagnostics and therapeutics. Um, but you know, if I, if I were to really think about two places in the value chain uh, that really have the most promise, it would be those two things, the kind of connecting people, uh, engaging people on one hand and diagnostics and therapeutics uh, on the other. Well, there's, that's great insight. You know, in innovation, we think a lot about connecting the, the players in healthcare, both sides of the fence, the providers and the patients and the other players, and also about giving them help with decision-making but not, not the latter, not diagnostics. I think that's something for us to think about and focus on. Great insight, but you talk about there may be a rapid acceleration. We've always heard, like Steve, we've always talked about value, you know, we're gonna move into value-based care. And we talked, oh, you and I've been thinking about it for 20 years, right? Never really, it's come and creeps along in a linear way. And a lot of things are like the patient's um, rights and their access to data and HIPAA being misinterpreted. What we currently have this new regulation coming from ONC about patient-mediated data access. You know, Steve, what do you think? Like, what's the position you have on that? Well, how do you think about that? These yeah, I, I, I guess what I'd say, David, is that um, to this point, I don't know what Category Five disruption that happens, whether it's internal or external, that changes that. But at this point, I think, frankly, most of the people in the provider world. Are taking the path of least resistance, and you know, I mean, it's no different than you know the the um, CMS thing on transparency. So the answer was, uh, I'm going to put my charge master on on our website, you know, my 2,800 pages of Excel. You know, that's not really transparency. So I, I think one of two things will happen: either either something will happen at a at a federal or state level that just really forces folks to either succeed or die, or you'll start to see some uh, providers and payers working together to really create uh, real transparency. We're working with a, with a company uh, and an insurer now to look at what would it mean if, if, if a patient could get a knee replacement in our place? And the kind of questions she asked were, all right, what's the range of, of, of outcomes I'm going to have? I'm a, I'm a half marathon runner. You know, well, you have a 38% chance of running half marathons based on our five years of data of our outcomes. You know, potentially this is what our competitors are. And then what check am I going to have to write? Not maybe, not well, our anesthesiologist is out, so I can't tell you. It would be what check am I going to have to write to get those outcomes? Oh, and by the way, I saw that you had a 3% readmission rate. I understand that that can happen. And it's 3%. Um, if that happens, am I paying or you pay? I mean, those are the, that, to me, that's the exciting part about working with, uh, with Microsoft and Insurer, Innovacer, to get all those things together. And I think what will happen in a place like Philadelphia, if one place commits to doing that, then I think that will become the standard of care and everybody will scurry around. I think that has a better chance of happening than you know, the federal government you know, basically mandating it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I've been actually weaving in questions from the audience. So one of the things that's come up, because we've talked about the role of humans and the role of robots, you know, one of the one of the audience said, glad to hear a discussion of the need to attend to the social aspects for AI, device and patients. But what about the interface between AI and the medical team? Will it, renders, will it render humans dumb by telling them the diagnosis such that physicians will no longer need to diagnose anything? I don't think so. I mean, you know, look, I think, um, you know, the, there's all these sort of, I think, stupid articles of, you know, we're not going to need radiologists anymore. Um, you know, I, I do think, you know, it took us 50 years to get doctors and nurses to work together, and we're not going to have to get doctors and robots to work together. So actually, one of the things that I wanted to do was start the first center for intersentient education between uh, the, between humans and uh, between doctors and androids. But I, you know, I do think we'll have to really start to look at how that AI entity, you know, becomes a uh, part of the team. 
and, and how we, we don't just take it for granted, uh, but that we uh, have it be part of the team. I think if you look at what happened with some of the Watson things that didn't succeed, it was because everybody said, boy, that must be smarter than we are in cancer diagnosis, and it wasn't always the case. You know, there are two points I would make here. Uh, if I just focus on imaging uh, right now, um, you know, if you look at uh, the latest imaging technologies that are used for uh, pathology, uh, as that goes digital, uh, which it will, uh, we're really now talking about uh, data sets that are so large as to really defy human comprehension. And so there will be necessarily a partnership between human and machine uh, just in order to kind of ingest and comprehend uh, what, what goes on in those digital slides. Uh, and then, you know, in, our, uh, in one effort that we did around uh, radiation therapy planning, you know, we really were, you know, uh, motivated by wanting to reduce the just tiresome, mindless burden of kind of pixel by pixel clicking to find the, you know, to do the segmentation of tumors in the uh, MRI images. Um, and then we're sort of amazed by the black magic and the judgment and the experience and wisdom that radiologists uh, and cancer specialists bring in uh, to the final step in radiation therapy planning. So the possibility of AI just relieving a lot of mindless burden and sort of liberating clinicians to really bring their kind of creative wisdom to bear. I, I think there's this, you know, I, I again see it as a, a great opportunity to enhance that partnership between man and machine. Yeah, and the future, look, the future I see is one in which, you know, doctors, nurses, other health professionals, and AI uh, work together to, to the maximum of their capability. It's not that doctors are captain of the ship, it's just that here's a team, and in certain areas, different parts of that team will be able to lead. Uh, it's a great, and this slide really illustrates a lot of what we've talked about in this webinar, really, how care teams and AI need to work together and learn to work together. That'll take some effort, right? We need to learn to do that. We need to take some risks and change what we do. But the ultimate goal is this quadruple aim, right? Getting care teams that are focused on the well-being of themselves as well as the people they serve, having a positive patient experience, creating value, reducing costs, and addressing the health of the population. You know, I'm going to end this webinar again. I've weaved in a lot of the questions during the process, and, and instead of taking them at the end, I hope people appreciate that in the audience. But I think we end up with the first title of the slide, Beyond Interoperability. So um, one last question before we end. How do you envision interoperability advancing to something else, like interchangeability? Are standards the answer? What's really going to be, how will AI play a role here? How are we going to really address this issue of data, the data silos, the data, you know, inability to look across data because of different data sets? It's what we do at Innovacer. Your thoughts, gentlemen, before we end. So I'll, I'll just do it in 30 seconds. I think what, what's happening in the consumer world will happen in the, in the health world. You know, I'm a Mac guy, and when I was using Macs in the past, I couldn't use PowerPoint because Microsoft at that time didn't want, you know, I mean, uh, Steve Jobs didn't want Microsoft products on Mac. That's clearly unsustainable. And what we have today with the fragmented EMR situation is also unsustainable. So the future that I see is that literally there will be opportunities to interact with any part of the healthcare ecosystem, access that data, digest that data, and come up with better solutions. And uh, yeah, just uh, uh, also in 30 seconds, just to add, if I focus on what's coming next in uh, the technology to enable all this, I think um, we'll start to see a much more concerted focus on really tackling uh, the management of patient identities. Uh, it's sort of the one true missing piece. Uh, today, I think we're getting all the other pieces uh, together pretty well right now. So patient That's identity. Awesome. That's awesome. Gentlemen, thank you so much. This has been a very enlightening webinar. Thank you, audience, for participating. This is great. Uh, and thank you for all, all the questions and our panelists for answering. With this, this concludes our webinar.